Of all the systems you're likely to meet in your first physics class, far and away the most important is the simple harmonic oscillator. In other words, the basic setup of a block attached to a spring. No other system so thoroughly permeates virtually every corner of physics, from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics to quantum field theory. It's a setup that you're guaranteed to meet again and again throughout your physics education, and so it's a good idea to learn it well from the get-go. But why is this seemingly innocuous problem so ubiquitous in so many areas of physics? That's what I want to explain in this video. We'll start by reviewing the basic setup, and after that, we'll get into why it's so important. We've got a block of mass m sitting on a frictionless table. It's hooked up to a spring, which is itself anchored to a wall on the other end. If you give the block a little kick, or if you pull it out a ways and then let it go, it'll oscillate back and forth from side to side like a sine or cosine function. We call these sinusoidal oscillations simple harmonic motion. Here's how we understand all this using Newton's laws. Whenever we move the block, we stretch or compress the spring, which therefore tries to pull or push the block back toward its equilibrium position. The equilibrium is the position where the spring is happy and relaxed. It's neither compressed nor stretched and so it exerts no force on the mass. Say we stretch the spring away from equilibrium by a distance x. How hard the spring pulls the block back toward equilibrium will be proportional to x, as well as how stiff the spring is, which is measured by another parameter called the spring constant k. So the force is minus kx, and the f equals ma equation for the block is ma equals minus kx. We can make this look a little neater by moving the m to the right-hand side. And then it's also convenient to define a new symbol for the fraction k over m that shows up there. Call it omega squared, where omega is the square root of k over m. It'll be clear what that parameter means in a second. Meanwhile, if you've learned some calculus, then you know that the acceleration a is nothing but the second derivative of the position x of t with respect to time. And so we can express the f equals ma equation as the second derivative of x with respect to time equals minus omega squared times x. What that means is that to solve for the trajectory of the block, we just have to ask ourselves what kind of function x of t, when you take its rate of change twice in a row, gives us back the same function times this negative number, minus omega squared. That's exactly the property of sine and cosine. And so the general solution of this equation is x of t equals a times cosine omega t plus b times sine omega t, where a and b are numbers that depend on what the block is doing at t equals zero. How far did we pull it out, and or how fast did we kick it? I go through those derivatives and all this material in more detail in the notes, which you can get at the link in the description. So, we indeed find that the block sinusoidally oscillates back and forth around its equilibrium position in simple harmonic motion. The rate at which it oscillates is determined by omega, which we therefore call the natural frequency of the system. You should check that it indeed has units of 1 over seconds, as appropriate for a frequency. And notice that you don't get to pick omega. It's fixed by the stiffness of the spring and the mass of the block. And however you set the block moving, it'll always oscillate at this same rate, unless you do something like kick it so hard that it breaks the spring or crashes into the wall. Here's an animation I made that you can play with to see how this works. Just drag the sliders to choose the initial position and velocity that you want for the block, and then press start to see what its position versus time graph is going to look like. I'll put a link to that too in the description, and you can play around with it for yourself. There's one more thing we need to review before we can step back and understand why this simple system is so prevalent, and that's the potential energy of the spring. As the block slides back and forth, it's constantly speeding up or slowing down, and so its kinetic energy, k equals 1 half mv squared, is always changing. But if we add on the potential energy stored in the spring, u equals 1 half kx squared, then the total energy is a constant. And we can check that just by taking the rate of change of e. In the first term, we bring down that power of 2 to get m times v, and then because of the chain rule, we need to multiply that by the rate of change of v, which is the acceleration a. Likewise, in the second term, we again bring down the 2 and get kx, and then that gets multiplied by the rate of change of x, which is the velocity v. Now, if we pull out this common factor of v, then the thing in parentheses vanishes because of f equals ma. So, the total energy is indeed a constant. Notice that the force f equals minus kx is related to the potential energy u equals 1 half kx squared by f equals minus du by dx. In other words, the force is equal to minus the slope of the potential energy curve, and that's the general relationship between force and potential energy. Notice that it means that in equilibrium, where the force is equal to zero, 
the slope of the potential must vanish. In fact, you can think about the potential energy curve as if it were a frictionless hill with a particle sliding along it. In the case of the harmonic oscillator, the hill is a parabola. The equilibrium point is at the bottom of this well. If you set a particle at rest there at x equals zero, it'll just happily sit there forever. If you set it down away from the equilibrium, however, it will rock back and forth about the bottom of the well, in the same way that the block oscillates back and forth around its equilibrium position. Thinking about the potential energy curve like this as a hill is a very powerful way of quickly developing your intuition for how a particle in a general potential will behave, without ever doing the hard work of trying to solve the F equals ma equation. In an earlier video, I told you about how we can apply that strategy to learn a ton about otherwise hard physics problems just by sketching a picture of the potential, like understanding the kinds of shapes a planet orbiting a star can follow. I'll link that up in the corner if you haven't seen it. Even with a very complicated potential, where we have no hope of writing down a simple solution for the trajectory, we can still qualitatively understand what the particle will do just by picturing the potential like a hill. Which brings us to the reason why the harmonic oscillator is so incredibly important and far-reaching. Consider a particle moving in any potential u of x. Here's a random example. We would like to once again solve the f equals ma equation to determine the trajectory x of t. But outside of a handful of potential energy functions described in textbook examples, finding a simple solution to this equation for a complicated potential like this one will be a hopeless task. So how can we make progress? Well, the first thing you should do when someone hands you a potential energy curve is to identify its stable equilibrium points. An equilibrium is again a point where the force on the particle vanishes, and so the slope of the potential will be zero there. A stable equilibrium point is one that's at the bottom of a well, as opposed to the top of a hill. We can, of course, write down the exact solution to the F equals ma equation for a particle that's set down at rest at an equilibrium point. The force vanishes, and so the particle will just happily sit there forever. On the other hand, if you give the particle at a stable equilibrium a little tap, it'll oscillate back and forth around the bottom of the potential, just like the block on a spring oscillated around the bottom of its parabolic well. You'll see this behavior all the time in your daily life if you pay attention. When you rock gently in a chair, you're oscillating around a stable equilibrium. When you drop an ice cube in a drink, it bobs up and down around its equilibrium height. Your coat hanging on the hook is swaying slightly around its equilibrium axis. And the basic reason is that when you're nearby a stable equilibrium point of almost any potential, the bottom of the hill looks just like the parabola of the symbol harmonic oscillator. And this isn't some rough qualitative analogy. We can make it mathematically precise. We can expand any potential u of x in powers of x around a stable equilibrium point using a Taylor series, like you might have learned about in your math classes. u of x equals u of 0 plus u prime of 0 times x plus one half u double prime of zero times x squared, and so on. Here's what's going on in this formula. First of all, if you're sitting right at x equals zero, then when you evaluate the potential, you're obviously gonna get u of zero. Then if you take a tiny step away from there, so that x is a small but non-zero number, the potential is still going to be close to u of zero, but now it'll be shifted slightly away by the slope u prime of zero times the displacement x. In other words, the change in u is the rise over run, times the run. That's already a good approximation to most functions near a given point. But it's actually not that useful to us in this particular case because we've put our origin at an equilibrium point where u of 0 and u prime of 0 both vanish. To get a better approximation, we have to include the terms with higher powers of x in the Taylor series. By including more and more of these terms, we get a better and better approximation to our function. And when we add up all the infinite number of terms, we reproduce the exact function. But we don't need an infinite number of terms to get a good approximation to our potential near the stable equilibrium point. We just need the first non-zero one, the quadratic term. u of x equals 1 half times u double prime of 0 x squared. But that's the potential energy of a spring, with spring constant k equals u double prime of 0. And that's the point. Almost any potential energy function, however complicated, reduces to the simple harmonic oscillator potential in the neighborhood of its stable equilibrium points. This is why the simple harmonic oscillator is so prevalent. Systems tend to settle into stable equilibrium, and small disturbances make them oscillate around it. So the first thing we should do with any potential energy function is find its stable equilibrium points, and then ask what happens when we perturb slightly away from them. A particle that's released there will oscillate around the equilibrium in simple harmonic motion with natural frequency square root k over m. 
That is, omega equals the square root of u double prime of zero divided by m. To understand the physics farther away from the equilibrium points is usually much harder. The bigger x gets, the more important the higher power corrections in the Taylor series, like x cubed and x to the fourth, become. But we can often get approximate solutions by treating those as perturbations of our harmonic oscillator solution. All this may or may not sound unfamiliar, but if you've studied the simple pendulum before, you've seen it in action, though maybe not using this language. If a pendulum is inclined at an angle theta, where the rod is of length l, then the mass will sit at a height h equals l minus l cosine theta above the bottom. And so its potential energy is u equals mgh. Write s for the arc length coordinate that the particle traces out, so that theta equals s over l. Then we can write the potential energy as u of s equals mgl times 1 minus cosine of s over l. Here's what it looks like. The stable equilibrium point is of course in the middle, at s equals 0, where the pendulum hangs straight down at rest. And we can check by taking the derivative of the potential energy. The derivative of the cosine gives us minus sine, and then we get a 1 over l from the chain rule, making u prime of s equals mg times the sine of s over l. And if we plug in s equals 0, we indeed get sine of 0 equals 0. The second derivative is meanwhile mg over l times cosine of s over l. If we plug in s equals 0 there, we get u double prime of 0 equals mg over l. Note that it's positive. That's how we know we're at a stable equilibrium, as opposed to the top of the arc where the slope of the potential also vanishes, but the second derivative is negative. That's an unstable equilibrium, because if you take a tiny step away from it, the pendulum will swing far away. So our Taylor expansion around equilibrium is u of s equals 1 half u double prime of 0 times s squared. And if we plug in u double prime equals mg over l, we get a simple harmonic oscillator with that spring constant. The frequency of oscillations around the equilibrium, square root k over m, will therefore be omega equals the square root of g over l, which you might recognize as the familiar formula for the frequency of a pendulum. Taylor expanding around the equilibrium in this context is often called the small angle approximation because it amounts to expanding the f equals ma equation for the pendulum around theta equals zero. In that neighborhood, the system reduces to a simple harmonic oscillator, and so the pendulum sinusoidally oscillates around its equilibrium position. You can go through all these details in the notes I wrote up, which you can get at the link in the description. You can also play with the animations I made to go along with this video, which I think are really helpful for building up your intuition. Make sure you've seen that earlier video I shared about how much you can learn about a system by thinking about the potential as if it were a hill. Please like, subscribe, and leave any questions in the comments, and thank you so much for watching.